One of the toughest things that investors have to deal with is market volatility and understanding whether the market is overpriced. Partly, this is because the market always seems to be getting overpriced. So the real question here is whether it is dangerously so from the point of view of the risk of a correction. Here we are going to be looking at four methods which I use to understand how well priced the market is presently based on looking at a combination of different indicators which can easily be obtained. And the benefit of that is that it will give you a bit more confidence around what to expect of the market and to provide some context for its movement. So number one, the Schiller price earnings ratio. So first off, what is the price earnings ratio? Well, it's what it says it is. It's the mean price of stocks on the stock market divided by their mean earnings. What Robert Schiller did here, which is a bit different, is that he's used the rolling average of 10 years of earnings and adjusted this for inflation. Without doing this, the price earnings or PE ratio would be much spikier than we see in the chart here. And therefore it would be much more difficult to see trends. So what this chart is, is the data that was used by Robert Schiller to help write his book, Irrational Exuberance. And I think you can agree from this title that Schiller feels that there's a certain amount of irrationality in the current pricing of the market. In particular, over the last three decades, clearly this PE ratio has been much higher than it has been historically. That's actually a really interesting subject in itself, but let's leave that for now. In the meantime, we'll just assume that these last three decades are the most relevant ones to understanding where the current PE ratio, i.e. as it sits today, fits historically. Let's just say that a value of 25 here reflects roughly what has been typical of the price earnings ratio over the past three decades. In doing so, we're effectively saying that this reflects a new normal or paradigm where we just accept that the PE ratio should be higher than it has been historically. Now, this is actually something that Schiller has warned about, and it's what he's talking about when he refers to irrational exuberance. But we're going to ignore that. But just recognize that whether or not this is the right thing to do is a bit of an open question, which we can leave for another time. As the Schiller PE ratio sits presently, it's a little above the typical for these recent decades at a value of 28. However, if we look at the history of this ratio, it's not uncommon for it to sit above average for extended periods of time. So being a little above the average is not necessarily a red flag. What it probably does mean though, is that there is a lot of room for the market to fall in value since it's not underpriced relative to the historical mean either. So in terms of price to earnings ratio, I would say that while it's not exactly red on a traffic light scale, because it's not extremely high presently, and as we said, it can sit above that average for long periods, it's nonetheless a bit overpriced, historically speaking. So I would give it an orange. Measure number two is called the Brock value. So this is an indicator which I think is really interesting and based on some really sound thinking and that's the Brock value. You can find this at the website at the top of the page here. The idea of the Brock value is that it works in a similar way to the Schiller ratio but it takes into account what level interest rates are at as well. If you think about that, that makes a lot of sense because higher interest rates should bring pressure on shares because then investing in cash becomes more attractive, while at the same time being a lot safer bet, especially if you were needing to invest in a shorter period of time. The way you read this chart is to see where the value of the S&P index is relative to the Brock value currently. The Brock value is effectively an estimate of where the S&P 500 index should currently be given current earnings and current interest rate levels. The chart expresses this in terms of overpriced and underpriced bands. From the chart, we can see that the 
estimated ROC value falls well below the current value of the S&P 500 index. That is not a particularly good sign because as we can see from this chart, it's rare for the Brock value to fall outside of these upper and lower bounds. So this very clearly suggests that the S&P 500 should be lower than it presently is. And if the market dynamics remain consistent with how they have behaved for the past two decades, as BrockValue.com points out, something here is wrong. So I'll give the Brock value indication of market direction a red light. Number three, the long-term trend. The next indicator is based on something that I think is just a really useful exercise to do, which is that you should look at the really long-term trend and try to figure out how out of whack the market is presently with that trend. I've plotted here the S&P index on a log plot, and that being the case, we should remember that we should expect compounding growth to appear as a straight line on this chart. If I go ahead and try to roughly fit a straight line to this plot, what we see here is that the market is currently sitting a little bit ahead of where we would expect it based on this trend, but not too badly so, and certainly not as badly as a few months back like up here. Of course, we're cheating a little bit here in saying that because we would get a different slope depending on which time period we were fitting this line to. But as a reasonable guide to the immediate future, I don't think this is too bad. So a little bit like we saw earlier with the PE ratio information, we can conclude from this that there is more potential downside than up because the market is ahead of the trend, but not necessarily badly so. And indeed, looking at other time periods, we can see that the market can certainly sit above this trend for considerable periods of time. So in terms of where the current share market index is relative to its historical trend, I don't think this represents a huge overvaluation, but it does tend to suggest that there's more potential for downside than up. So I think this indicator is giving us an orange light on our traffic light scale. Number four market volatility. The last indicator that we're going to look at is an interesting one also. Here we will consider the current degree of volatility in the market and also what the current economic situation is. I've seen an econophysics paper that talked about an increase in volatility being a potential indicator of a steep market decline, i.e. like a crash. And if we look at the chart here, we can see that there is an increase in volatility, particularly in the second half of the chart, which we could potentially see as a bad sign. But we also know that at the moment, inflation is high and interest rates are high. The last time we had a period like this, was through the late 1960s and 70s. And during that time, the market tended to fluctuate up and down a fair amount without much of an upward trend. But essentially the reason the market becomes volatile is that no one is sure what its fair price should be. Time to try to draw this all together. So this video has explained four indicators, which I personally find useful based on my background in studying physics, econophysics and fractals. But it's just my personal opinion that these are useful and I'm showing them to you just for your interest. None of these indicators can be relied upon to make accurate predictions of the future. And it's really important to remember that stock markets and other financial markets have a high degree of inherent unpredictability and often behave in the exact opposite way that you would expect given the economic situation. Remember, if you invest in some sort of managed fund for your retirement, you probably shouldn't be worrying too much about what the market is going to do because the whole idea of that is that you just write out whatever the market does. You should base your investment decisions on your own personal situation and get advice from a qualified financial advisor. 